Right brain realism is the antithesis of the idea that any of us are only creative or analytical, and instead posits not that you can be both or should be both, but that you already are. We're going to look at not only the antiquated idea of right brain versus left brain, but challenge all the things we think we know about ourselves and how we think, learn, and communicate for a greater sense of balance in our lives, which will hopefully allow for a greater sense of self-awareness, purpose, and empathy, and offer practical methods to help us get a little closer to the people we want to become. Let's get to it. another episode of Right Brain Realism. I'm your host, Austin Morris, and uh, I am very, very excited about today's guest. She's truly one of my favorite people on the planet. Um, this podcast, honestly, is is kind of a, a culmination of a couple years of self-growth for me, because uh, a couple years ago, I, I looked up and realized that even though I was doing cool stuff, I, I wasn't really happy all the way and I wasn't really satisfied and I, and I decided to do something about it and uh, today's guest was there uh, for a lot of the first few months of it and kind of not only watched me grow but really really helped me and encouraged me along the way and uh, I can honestly say that this podcast might not exist uh, without uh, my friendship with this person so welcome to the show Broadway's current and future Elphaba uh, <laughs> my very good friend Lindsay Heather Pierce to the show how are you darling you doing well oh my god I'm good I don't know you as just Austin Morris I know you as Austin J Morris Austin J know. Morris yeah that's, that's the that's, that's the well, I'm Lindsay Heather Pierce. You are Austin J. Morris. And that's the title of the show, but I always feel weird like saying it out loud. Like it's it's written as Austin right. J. Morris. Because yeah. if you Google Austin Morris, you just get a bunch of British cars. So I have to <laughs> use the J. <laughs> I would uh, never have put that together. Yeah. Wow. I, only, I didn't even know it till I was like, well, on my first uh, my first cruise ship, uh, a bunch of British people wow. came up and were like, do you know are you like, aware like, that you're your a British name, car? <laughs> yeah. They're like, your name might as well be Ford Chevy. And I was like, And you're what? like, oh my anyway, God, thank yeah. you. <laughs> I love it. Um, perfect. So actually, that that kind of brings up a, a great point. Lindsay and I uh, know each other because we uh, <laughs> we had a we very a long once. contract <laughs> together. Yeah, we did this thing one time. Uh, we worked on oh the Seaborn Sojourn together. We were... Uh, we saw each other's faces every day for almost nine months, um, and it was it was fantastic. We we started in we started rehearsals in England, and then uh, we flew to Auckland, New Zealand, New and then Zealand. went all the way around Australia, uh, over to Africa, and Africa to Asia, yeah. over to Alaska, and um, it was Crazy. it was an amazing. We even stopped in Russia one day. <laughs> yeah, but we weren't allowed to get off the ship. Yeah, we weren't allowed to get off the ship. Our dancers were because they're Ukrainian. Ukrainian. Um, oh my god! But yeah, so we we we, I, I think it's fair to say that um, we all, our whole cast, uh, uh, learned a lot about ourselves and each other, and just yeah, uh, I would say it was a time of growth, some some yeah. by trial, but uh, yeah. it was such an amazing time. We got to do some very cool things. I had, um, you know highlight of my career singing well with you and uh also with you know sir tim rice we got Timmy. to do that it was, it was amazing amazing i'm trying to get him on the show i've reached out tim we're, Tam. We're oh we're don't don't let him hear me call him that <laughs> <laughs> actually i think he'd love it i think he'd be very tickled hey, we'll see i'll let him you know what i will send him this exact clip oh and God. we'll go from there but um so yeah that's how Lindsay and i know each other and we we really got very close over i mean you kind of have no choice but to get close over eight months oh my god of, yeah seeing each other's faces. So for the people who, who don't know your name, uh, they should, uh, but let's get into, you have one of the coolest just stories uh, of, of anyone I know of who you are. And where saying, you yeah, like, and, yeah, you're right. Like, yeah, you. yeah, do. <laughs> but, <laughs> it's okay, but you know what? You should be proud of it because it's, it's do, a fantastic story. I do have story. a story, yeah. Um, so let's, let's just let you kind of tell people who you are, where you came from. Yeah. Um, get into it. My name is Lindsay Heather Pierce. Um, and I am from a small town in Northern California. I'm from Modesto, California, um, Central Valley 209, if anybody out there cares. Um, and I 
was adopted into a family of athletes. I was adopted before I was born. Um, Heather, my middle name, is the name of my birth mother. And my birth mother lived with my, this is crazy, I'm going to make it real small, but my birth mother lived with my parents while she was pregnant with me, um, escaping a difficult, not like a scary situation, but just like getting out of a difficult situation, having a place of peace to be able to raise her young son and birth this child that ended up being me, um, a screamer. And, um, and my birth mom and my adopted mom became best friends. And my birth mom essentially gave me to my mom and my dad. And they have remained friends. She was at my opening on Broadway or my debut, all of it. It's crazy. It makes me, it One makes me want to My favorite scream. things I've ever seen was your birth mom and your adopted mom outside the marquee with like your <laughs> face as Elphaba. With their I'm nails like, painted a la Glinda and Elphaba. Can you believe? My, gosh, I, my, my it's heart so was ridiculous. A, was a, was a flutter like that's yeah. one of my favorite pictures because it's just yeah. it's just so indicative of a beautiful story and the team yeah. that that is behind mm-hmm. what you've done anyway I, i've been no so no it's to, no they've remained not at best all friends. they've remained best friends and so um it that i won't lie to you that also that also came with the territory as i got older of a, a bit of confusion and feelings of you know, fear and betrayal and abandonment and also deep curiosity and longing for something that I didn't know I had because I, I knew my birth mom. I, I knew that I had one and I, I knew something about her, but I didn't know who she was. And she was in my life as my mom's best friend because they had absolutely fallen in love with each other. But she was like, I'm trying to raise my own family and I want this child to be able to attach to you guys. So they decided that they weren't going to tell me the, the big old story until I was like any, I think like 21. Um, and it, and if, and, and if I wanted to know, so it was, and it was also something to do with like the birth father. And there was a bit of, he, he's a questionable individual. Sorry if you're listening to this, but you are. Um, and <laughs> I don't, I don't beat around the bush and, um, he's, he doesn't seem like someone that's for me. That's all I'm going to say. And, um, and so, and it was interesting looking back on it, seeing Heather's, um, uh, presence in my life and how similar we are in terms of like personality, interests, disinterests, food tastes, uh, senses of humor, if you get Heather in a room with me, you're like, oh my God, for sure, blood, blood relatives. Um, and so it's, it's interesting to be kind of like a true product of nature versus nurture. Um, because a lot of, a lot of who I am is, is nature. And a lot of who I am is also nurture because I've been raised by incredible parents and birthed by an incredible woman. So it's, it, it's, been a really interesting ride in that regard and it's been an interesting slice of humble pie to take a step back as someone who personally does not want children and and will likely never become a natural parent um and now at the my mom was 30 when she adopted me and my birth mom was I think 28 when she had me and I'm now 29 I'm between their ages and I cannot imagine what that must have been like for them I can't imagine what that must have been like for them and realizing that I'm not going to speak for all parents, but I know that mine were doing their best. Um, so that, that kind of stepping out and maybe those are my recovery thing too, which we'll get into, but stepping out of that area of like, what was all about me? And I was like, what was my mom supposed to give up her best friend? You know, and like, was, was my, my birth mom supposed to give up this woman that saved her in a moment and, and my, and my father that like saved her and loved her in a moment of like, deep turmoil and took care of her son and yada yada. So anyway, I got adopted. I was raised, I adopted into a family full of athletes. Mm -hmm. So then little star shine me came in and they were like the hell. And not just, and not just athletes, like professional athletes, athletes. Athletes. My, my middle brother, Heath, um, I'm the youngest of three boys, um, four kids, three boys. I'm not a boy. Anyway, family of athletes. (laughs) You're the Um, third boy. Yeah, my I'm the third, I'm the fourth boy in a family, and in, in the youngest of four boys. Um, but I, yeah. So my 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 brothers were you know always playing soccer or football or basketball, anything. I mean, they were so athletic, and I would try. 
um, but I wasn't good. Uh, but I, I wanted to do what my brothers wanted to do because I loved them and I was obsessed with them. And my parents were really good about being like, listen, we know our children and we know, we know genetically what they're geared for. And as well as just like how, how we've gotten to know them over X amount of years that we've had these babies. We have this one who like, she loves broccoli and sweet potato and all of our kids hate broccoli and sweet potato except for her. So like they did a and really good job. just got of- more different from there. Yeah, and it just kept getting more and more different. And so they were really good about being like, okay, she wants to try. Like, I really loved swim team. They're like, okay, well, she wants to try swim team. She wants to, she wants to do soccer. She wants to do softball. Um, but I was always, I always had a very, very strong attention deficit. And, uh, and I, needed, I needed intense focus. And I was always coming home, memorizing entire stories out of books and singing Jesus loves me in Spanish. And like, like, because, because I would learn so quickly, I just had such a, a brain for absorbing and slowly. You know they, that's really interesting. Realized, not to, yeah. Speaking of, speaking yeah. of ADD yeah. um, and not to derail your story, but yeah. you said something that's very interesting. Again, the, the whole concept of, of right brain realism is just kind of yeah. understanding ourselves and our total selves and how our brains mm-hmm. actually work. Not just so we can know yeah. ourselves, but so we can interact with the world around us with more empathy and all those sorts 100%. of things and i think add is something that gets thrown around so much it's almost become like a joke and i, I as someone with yeah. adhd it's not something like that bothers me when it's used as a joke yeah. but i i do think it's something that people don't understand uh very well if, if you don't live with it um yeah. well, and, and you just assume that people can't learn or they can't but what's very interesting is i'm astounded at how many artists are quite have ADD or ADHD, yeah. ADHD, and like you said, yeah. you—it's hard to focus in class and stuff. But you'd come home with books memorized, and it's yeah. like, wh- how? Where did that come from? And it's has again, an outlet and an avenue that they that that there there's a way to unlock the power of the. They're not disorders. I mean, they, they're they're identified as d- attention deficit disorder or you know a temper uh, whatever it is. And and learning now in my older age. Uh, my older age, I'm 29 years old. Um, but like, but for example, for example, like I, I didn't realize that ADD is is a slightly archaic term in terms of like, in terms of like it's it all is under the the blanket of ADHD. You might not have hyper, like a hyper like disorder, essentially, but the ADD goes into that, and your the way that your hyperness manifests is with an attention deficit or like a hyper focus which is what I had which was what like yeah. I would be in class and they would be on to arithmetic and I would be seven chapters through my literature book and because you're not be ready like, to move on because you're so focused I'm, on this I'm in you're not ready to wanna, change or someone focus. would drop a pencil and I would see the pencil drop and they'd go on and I'd be like why does the pencil make a sound? Why does it go ding, 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 ding when it drops? And why does it do this? And where was that pencil made? And not in like my brain would just create stories. My brain would go into this if I got derailed, which as a child was a little difficult for other people to kind of handle. Um, and, and my parents ve- vehemently were like, you are not going on medication. And that does not mean that other people should not go on medication they just knew that what they what i was experiencing um that i needed an avenue and that i clearly yeah. was not getting an avenue and that's why i was like more trouble than all three of my brothers combined um and seriously like any time that my my teachers would go up to my parents and be like i want to talk to you about lindsay they'd be like what the hell did she do what did she do this time and usually it was she was singing the entire soundtrack of miss saigon like, you know, or she was doing this and they were like... sounded great, but I was trying to teach. I was trying to teach. In the middle of her performance. I was I'm trying so to teach sorry. geography. I interrupted her show for yeah, my yeah. lessons, and, man. And that's the thing is they were like, okay, okay. And then and then eventually when we'd been living in Portland for a little while, um, my dad was going to uh, Multnomah Bible College in Oregon. And, um, and then we moved back to Modesto. And in Modesto, there was a children's 
theater company within a, an adult opera company. Um, and so that was like my first, I was doing like Madama Butterfly and, and, and watching the Mikado and uh, Carmen and uh, Magic Flute. And so I got to learn and from these really like operas, a kind of intense, I don't know, I don't know much about it anymore, but learning, learning from these like Titan vocalists um, at the time was pretty bonkers. And and learning how to translate languages and how fascinating languages were and and like phonetics and and all of that kind of it was just like a whole world of and I was a Lord of the Rings kid so I was like this is like Elvish this is amazing and um I couldn't I couldn't get enough of it I was such a, a I'm such a nerd for linguistics and I'm not would, good at any would, of it I would pay but, money to see you you were talking about TikTok uh, earlier I would absolutely oh my god pay money to watch you do an aria that you've translated into elvish like <laughs> and if, if Lindsay I, doesn't I, I do it try. someone out there needs I to i will try to i wish it. i wish i was still good like like some people that we know that like can can really do the phonetics in the trip but i was so obsessed with that stuff and then i mean i just did oh, go ahead languages are are obviously very interesting and, and something that we've talked about a lot in mm -hmm. the past of just the beauty of of language and and and, that and how one little important. switch makes makes exactly. a context and change and i'm assuming that's a, a kind of i don't know chicken or egg but shakespeare yeah. is also a huge love of yours uh, huge the, i was gonna get into the that theater yeah. and shakespeare don't always go together yeah yeah um, yeah and and that was that was actually something interesting was when i or interesting to me at least um everybody's everybody listening to this is like is it interesting lindsay um i i as i grew and i grew and i grew in the community theater and like in the children's programs um my high school my private high school that i went to didn't have at the time a theater program so when i was 16 i was like get me out of here and i talk about determination and uh, stubbornness. I, um, I kind of have a will of iron when it comes to some stuff and uh, which is um, a good trait and also a detriment. Um, and I, I told my parents- of the strong little child on the coffee table <laughs> Oh yeah, <laughs> just, just letting you see the she title just, of like, that's about just, you. She would just like flip through it every once in a while. Like, how am I doing staring, this today? I staring you down, <laughs> flipping through. <laughs> she, yeah. I, I can just imagine she got to the end of the book and she's like, that's not enough. Nothing, like, nothing, nothing makes sense. Yeah. Um, yeah. So my, my parents were like, listen, if you want to transfer out of this high school, I wanted to go to the junior college in my town because they had college theater and they had college classes and I would be able to take, I would be able to get call it like basically do high school in the morning from like eight to noon and just get like, get like my junior and senior shit done basically and then do from noon and on be a full-time college student which is what I wanted so I had to they were like if you're gonna do this uh show us show us the money and and like and not necessarily like the money but they were like you got to do it and I was like okay and I made the I made sure the meetings happened I wrote the entrance things and I did I did the essays and I got myself in and um and the the caveat to that is that the right word? The, uh, the kicker, I guess, was that um, you weren't actually allowed to be a full-time college student. And I was like, mm, that doesn't sit right with me. So I was like, excuse me, Mr. Dean, um, could you sign this please to give me permission to be a full-time college student? And he was like, okay. <laughs> I don't remember the name of that man, but I, like, I had to go to the Dean of the, the junior college to be like, give me what I want. <laughs> And um, at 16, and that was pretty wild, which was basically, I basically just wanted to be able to take courses while also, while also doing theater, which were credits. Like I wanted to be able to do the shows on top of school. And it, I was like, these credits don't matter. They're shows, they don't transfer, it, they, they, don't, they don't matter. So I was like, just give me what I want. And um, yeah, I was a tantrum child, whatever. I... Yeah, so I, I got done with that, and I went once I graduated high school. I graduated high school with eighty seven college credits, and when I got done with that, I did one year, one more year, as I was kind of trying to figure out where to go. I I auditioned in person for Elon University for their um, BFA program, and I was promptly denied. Um, fair enough. 
and I, I wasn't even allowed. I wasn't even, I like not allowed, but I didn't get a chance. I, I, I wanted to audition for Carnegie Mellon. I was not, I was not given an opportunity to audition. I mean, multiple, multiple colleges. And then I was like, wow, I, I must have not applied myself in a way that I, that I thought would work. Um, I don't think I, like, I, I remember coming out being like, am I not prepared? And do I not, do I not know how to audition for anything? And then, um, okay. I'm just gonna pop in here just for, for anybody who is listening to this, who is, is a going through the audition grind or has a kid in high school that wants to do it. But I, I, I want to just under, I don't want to gloss over the fact that we have the current (laughs) COVID current, uh, Elphaba on Broadway is sitting here talking about how she couldn't get into a college music theater program. And yeah. so that's not, then that's not to, that's not to shit on everybody's, college music theater programs. Everybody's like, path is different. It's now. just, it's yeah. just that your timing doesn't yeah. have to match everybody else's. I had never mm-hmm. taken a dance class or a voice lesson until I was in college. I walked into this music theater program and I was like, can yeah. I do this? And they were like, Sure, oh man. My God. Like they saw Please. some talent, I guess, but yeah, they, they kind of sat me down. Also, like, a boy. The record you need to earn so much. Also, <laughs> yes. a boy that helped also very much. That it I was a very boy. much a I boy and seemingly people. straight. And not not by seem like I know you are, but like they were like, oh please, oh, please, oh please, oh please, oh please, oh please, oh please, oh my god, oh my god, oh my god, oh my god. Um, yeah, and and yeah, that so was so just just for anybody in the grind feeling like no one sees what you do. <laughs> It, it doesn't yeah. really matter. Keep working yeah. and keep going and, and mm-hmm. you'll get where and, you need to go on and, your time. And that also connects to the reason why that was not, I think in the long run going to happen for me. One, uh, I think there was ego involved and I think there was a, a, a point of unpreparedness and that paved the way for Glee Project. Literally, I got the letter that I was not going to be accepted into Elon and that I would have to, and I knew that I was going to need to apply in the fall to be able to audition in the spring, again, for, for other colleges, for other, for other programs. And Valley's Got Talent came through, which was a, a talent competition in my hometown. And Robert Ulrich, Robert Ulrich, who is the, was the casting director for Glee and was casting Glee Project, is from Modesto, where I grew up, and was uh, a, um, was a judge for that talent competition. And I was determined to win so that I could pay for the next semester's worth of credits to be able to take more classes and prepare to audition in the spring. And I won that competition because I was like, I'm, if I if I get accepted to win this, if I get accepted to do this competition, I'm gonna win it. And because um, I was like, because I need to, I need to be able, I, I need to be able to afford my college applications and mailing them off, and I need to be able to take classes to prepare me for these auditions so I can make a new book and I can not be yeah. not sh- show my whole ass. It's an expensive, when I, when it's I an expensive business. An expensive to get business. Into it. It's hard. Even just and, all the printing you have to do, and, all and the then and then to and then to even like I had to fly to North Carolina to audition for Elon. So it was like it, you have to you have to physically go to a lot of these colleges, especially if they're East Coast. So I was like, if they, especially if I, at the if time, like it's changed money. a little bit that you can do your first audition uh, through yeah. video and stuff now. But at the mm-hmm. time, especially this was that long ago. I'm talking about right. it like it was the Middle Ages. But yeah, this it was just it, it's come so long. So. Yeah. In 2010, it was 2010 for me, and um, and I won that competition, and then I was going to um, begin applying again. I was like trying. I remember, I remember having such a hard time with my essay because I, like many other artists, suffer greatly and and battle greatly with imposter syndrome. So I, it at the time, and I think I'd had a little bit of scarring from my first experience, and I was like, what the hell? What the hell do they want to hear from me? Like my essay, what sets me apart as this like talented, kind of good looking, young ingenue type with dark hair and pale skin and light eyes and blah, blah, blah. Like what the hell sets me apart from being yeah. from- Which all of that sounds great until you walk into an audition room and And everybody looks exactly look, like yeah. you. Yeah. And, and you're yeah. like, oh, I could play Belle right now. And so could the rest of the goddamn room. And that was also a thing. That was also a thing that, like, small town me. I was very naive, and I didn't understand that there were 
how many people hundreds of me hundreds or at least how many people want to do this how many people want to do this and hundreds of people that look like me that look like you that yada yada and I was like wow um and that was that was my like a privilege check that was an ego check that was so there were so many things that made me go oh I've been living in like this really lovely bubble of like theater is like this fun little world and like we're all like together we're all a team and it's not that we're not but I really was like oh this is a business yeah. and like they need if they're like we don't have a spot for someone like you in our program they're not gonna cast you they're not gonna put you in the program they're not gonna hire you and so I was I was trying to figure out this essay long story as long as it could possibly be um yeah, I and think we're past I, long story short. It doesn't great. fucking okay. matter. Okay. It doesn't matter. And I, and I, I, in a moment of total vulnerability, I was like, mom, I'm having the hardest time. And she was like, why don't you message Robert Ulrich? Didn't you say that he added you on Facebook? And I was like, why would I message him? And she was like, well, he might, he might be able to be like, because he's a casting director, might be able to help you put your best foot forward. And I was like, that's a good idea. My mom's a genius. And uh, being some, being not a stage mom, like the less, the least stagey mom in the world. And like, she's quite literally a soccer mom. She's literally a soccer mom. And she's the the brain of an agent. Like she wants to be my man. She's the whole thing. She could be my manager. That would be a nightmare. I love you, mom. Um, (laughs) And um, I love you, Carol. And um, she was like, you could contact Robert Ulrich. And I was like, okay. And I, I put my big girl pants on and I sent a, a message on Facebook. And he was like, what's your number? I'm going to give you a call in 15 minutes. And I also didn't realize that this was like in the middle of the day, in the middle of the week for a casting agent. <laughs> and so it's like for a casting director. And, uh, and he gave me a call and he was like, I cannot tell you to audition for Glee Project, but if you wanted to, here's how you do it. And uh, it was basically like, if you wanted to, uh, your appointment is at 4 p.m. on this day. <laughs> it, that was essentially not, what it not was. Not that you should. Not that you, not should. That you should, but your but you appointment's could. at 4 p.m. on Wednesday. If you uh, showed up at 4 p.m. on Wednesday, no one else will be seen. It was literally 4 p.m. on Wednesday, like in, like December 23rd or something like that, or like December 11th or something like that. And uh, and I had gotten, I closed, I was doing a, a community production of, or a regional production of um, Cinderella. And I closed that and I drove right to L.A., and I auditioned for Glee Project in that big blue room that everybody in Glee's ever auditioned for. And, uh, and then I did the callback, and then I did the callback, and then I got Glee Project. And that's and probably why I didn't go to college. <laughs> for those of you who, don't, uh, who aren't uh, uh, 100% part of our business, you may or may not know what the Glee Project is. I assume yeah. that, you, that most people do. It's fine if you don't. <laughs> it was a mtv show is that correct no it was a it was an oxygen network nbc universal owned um talent competition for quote-unquote glee hopefuls and if you won the show you were put on fox's glee and uh we i was uh, very lucky i was with alex newell also a broadway baby um Sam Larson and Damien McGinty of Celtic Thunder, if anybody loves Celtic Thunder out there. And we, they, those two boys won. And Alex and I were runners up, but we also were given episodes. So we all got to be a part of Glee. Alex went on to be a huge part of Glee. And then that really skyrocketed my, I mean, I I went from like, I want to go to college to catapulted right into the business of Hollywood. Um, which was so you, yeah, at 16, intense. you were like, I want college, I want college, I want college. And then at 18, you were like, I think, I think maybe not college. I was, yeah, I was, I was 19 when I filmed the show. And then when I, uh, I turned 20 right after and I moved to Los Angeles, uh, by the seat of my pants and just did LA theater and, and all the ups and downs of television and film and theater and the waiting tables and, and doing really strange jobs um we could do a whole it, episode on just strange yeah jobs. just just strange artist jobs and 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 meeting really great people and the cabaret scene in los angeles and um yeah and then did my first cruise job in 2016 i did the norwegian cruise line and then uh vowed to never go back and then um and then lo and behold it's a tough life it, it's I a mean, tough it's life cool. and that, it, it's, it's glamorous that it was and a very big shift Instagrams. Yeah, it was a very big ship and that didn't that kind of didn't work for me much. And I was also just not in a I was mentally not in a place to be um in a box, um, you know, three feet below the water. Um I just 
I just, it wasn't, I was not mentally in a place, but when we did our job, I was like, so we also had portholes. So I was like, yes. Um, and that, that made a big difference, but, um, yeah. So and I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to redirect a little bit here because yeah. your story is amazing. Um, yeah. but I also don't want to waste too much of your time or, or the listeners. I want to try yeah. to keep it, um, well, please edit this shit. Possible. So you just, <laughs> please yeah. cut, cut, uh, cut. My, my podcast editor is named Robbie Kern and uh, hi Robbie. Uh, you know what? I'm just Robbie. Leave all of this. Make 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 them listen to it. Uh, yeah. No. Um, but you you were talking about not in a place, and that's kind of really yes. Um, we could talk about theater for hours mm -hmm. and hours and hours, but um, really, I want this to to be helpful for people who are entertainers, but also educators right. and entrepreneurs and anybody who just wants mm -hmm. to to kind of improve themselves and, and I kind of want to use this as a platform to kind of break some stigmas about ADD and all sorts of stuff. But yeah. you also have a very, very, very cool story about recovery, recovery. And mm -hmm. um, I'd love for you to just kind of talk a little bit about that because a lot of people think that to go into recovery or to go to rehab or to go to AA or to go whatever mm -hmm. you have to like hit rock bottom or whatever and, yeah. and I don't think that was really your case um it was so it was a in a way that. yeah yeah I I got sober February 4th 2018 is that correct yes um I was about to turn 27 yeah and um I is that right yes that is right wow it's been two and a half plus years um I, uh, that's one of the reasons why my first shift job was not successful because there was just so, there's alcohol everywhere on a ship and, and I, I come from, um, genetically, I come, I, I come from a family with depression, anxiety on, on either side. And then on one of the sides, uh, addiction, alcoholism, yada, yada, yada. I was, I, I was set up to like either be fine or like, we're not fine. And, um, and there had been tiny glimmers of like, Hey, something might be wrong. Um, and it was triggered by a specific event when I was in my earlier twenties, a very, very serious heartbreak and a very, very serious betrayal in a relationship. And that person had introduced me to party drug, like cause LA, LA is just like, party, party, party. Let's go out and get drinks. This is how we hang out. And I didn't know that there was another avenue for that because I, I moved out without a real sense of the world and with a very, um, blinders on a horse view of right and wrong. Um, and the gray areas were very gray. And so I, I, slowly like going out for drinks was like staying out till two in the morning and, and finding, finding myself in really strange and, in in unusual and sometimes frightening predicaments. And, and I also, as an artist, you know, a lot of us think that it's like, like Hemingway where I have to be like, I have to be bleeding and drunk to be able to write anything. You know what I mean? It that's, that's a real, that's a real thing. That's a real, anybody who's read the artist's way, it really, a lot of, a lot of recovery books and a lot of books about being a blocked artist or a blocked entertainer, entrepreneur, educator is like my best writing happens when I'm wasted and I'm, I'm only creative when my brain is somewhere else. And, and it's been very glorified. Yeah. And I, listen, if you, if you don't have a problem and you love to drink a tumbler of whiskey while you write, by all means, live your best life. But honestly, for me, it was, there was a romanticized idea of that Jack Kerouac, problematic, that Jack Kerouac, Ernest Hemingway, Zelda Fitzgerald. And I was like, these are not good examples <laughs> for me as a person. These are not healthy examples of, of artistry. And I wasn't getting, I just felt very, um, I felt very frozen in time and um and I was in towards the end of my drinking career um which which was very it did not go well I did not have a successful drinking career so I really had to like change avenues you know if you can't laugh about it 
I had to retire early. I, what did I say on the ship when people would be like, you don't want to drink it? I'd be like, I drank all mine, ma'am. <laughs> it's gone. I don't, I don't have, I don't have a quota anymore because I drank my quota. Like I'm done. I got no, I've, I've drank all mine. I've drank all mine. So I, um, and I went from being like someone who was like a cute, happy drunk to like, oh no, Lindsay's crying in the corner. <laughs> oh no, <laughs> um, we need to get her home. And, and, and that's because there was a self-medication that was happening and, and I wasn't dealing with a lot of things and they all caught up with me. And, and, um, and then I did find myself in a difficult situation where I was in a really difficult relationship, um, dealing with a, a, abuse in many, in many ways in a relationship. And, um, and I didn't hit like a, I hit a rock bottom in a way. It wasn't like I, that, you know, everybody's recovery story is still valid. And I won't lie. Sometimes when I have my butt in a chair and I'm sharing in a room, I'm like, what the hell do I have to bring to this table? Uh, like I didn't, I didn't end up homeless or I didn't, yada, yada, I didn't, I didn't do this, that, or the other, but it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Like some, some people, some people get sober and have never touched a drink and they, then their recovery is just as valid as mine is. But I did, I did lose trust with people and I did, lie a lot and I did um I was I was masking I was I was hiding I was um very frightened and paranoid all the time which is truly no place no way to live especially when you already have emotional and mental things that you are not dealing with that all manifest when the veil is very thin and I I also had to take a hard look at my relationship um and realize that my the the relationship that I had with this person that that came to an end thank god when I left for our ship job um that I was healing from that relationship and the relationship like the friendships around that relationship that were heavily um touched by my relationship with this one man um what's my point my point is the being able to open my eyes and go oh the relationships that I allow myself to become involved in say a lot more about me than they do about these people. And what I allow into my life, what I allow, what I allow myself to take, what I say is okay, the boundaries that I do not enforce. Yeah, but I mean, how many times was I like, that's not okay with me on the ship? Because I was learning to say, no, no, that doesn't work for me. That does not work for me. I didn't have boundaries. I didn't have boundaries for myself. So therefore I didn't respect anybody else's. So I found myself brought to my knees as we, as we like to say in recovery, I found myself brought to my knees. Um, and I, I find myself now wondering like, man, and I don't really, I don't really deal in what ifs because I'm not a gambler. That's not, that's not my poison, but I, um, I was like, man, I could have used recovery. We could all use a little bit of recovery, frankly, but I, I could have used recovery a lot younger in my life. But for so long, the stigma of like going to a shrink is like, is how I grew up with therapy. And, uh, and I'd been in therapy before and it's amazing. If anybody needs therapy, please go. It's so good for you. Um, and, and the idea of like, when you, when you go to a recovery pro AA or anything like that, anything, any type of recovery program for eating or love or narcotic, whatever it is that you need. And it's not just AA. It's not just, uh, it's not just under that blanket. There are multiple ways to recover from things, but I, um, the stigma around it of like, oh no, if I become sober, I'm like a freak. You Like how, am, how am I going to connect with anybody? How am I going to how am I going to go out and socialize? How am I going to do this? Saturday or the other? And I'll tell you what, I, I do it all the time. Well, not now because we're in a pandemic, but I do it all the time. I do it all the time. It's well, I mean, coffee. on it's Seaboard, on, on, on the ship that we mm -hmm. worked on together, it was all inclusive, including for us. It was we free, baby. Had access to free alcohol. And, and when I tell you... Um, I didn't take one sip. And, and just, and you know what? It was never mm -hmm. about that. Like, it was never like, Oh, I don't drink. And, and that's the thing is you don't have mm -hmm. to shame other people's habits because no. other people might not have the same journey or, or a problem yeah. or whatever. But mm -hmm. I just always respected the fact that you were like, oh, no, I'm good. And, and yeah, Shirley Temple's the, were my the, 
were my thing so on this hey, show. They're great. so good. And I got everybody drinking Shirley Temples with vodka. So there you go. There you go. I'll take, I'll take the one. <laughs> Dirty Shirley. But you yeah. said a couple of things that I want to kind of circle back to. And one of them yeah, yeah, is, yeah. is the stigma of I'm not homeless. I haven't lost all my money. I, yeah. I still, I'm still married. I only yell mm-hmm. at my partner or my kids sometimes. I'm still a good parent, but yeah. if you're not happy or whatever. That's, that is far enough to fall to say, Hey, yeah. maybe I should change some stuff. You don't have to hit rock bottom. You don't, yeah. it, you don't have to have that, that moment that, that says yeah. everything's broken and, and everybody's, you're not everybody's the happiest you can be. Different. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. But if you're if you're not striving for happiness or if you're using and again, I love oh my gosh, I love a good bourbon. Uh I yeah, totally. I drink quite often. I just don't drink a lot or I don't like to get drunk, but still I love a a good drink every once in a while, but or every twice in a while. But <laughs> the, I remember the, there was one time on the ship which might be problematic as a sober person, but you were having a an old fashioned that had one of those really good cherries those really like dark whiskey cherries. And I was like, I was like, I'm sober. And if my sponsor listens to this, I'm so sorry. But I, uh, I was like, can I just smell that really quick? <laughs> I was like, cause I just wanted to, the, the orange peel and the cherry. I was like, I just want to smell that. And then I, then the whiskey came through and I was like, oh. <laughs> because whiskey, whiskey yeah. was like my, my thing. And I was like, oh yeah, I forgot. And now, now in this pandemic, my fiance has this hand sanitizer. That's literally just pure vodka. And we, we always slather it in the car whenever we've like come come in from shopping or something or like getting groceries or something. And I'm always like, <laughs> <laughs> because, because the smell of like actual alcohol is a little triggering yeah. for me. And so I'm like, oh. As I can imagine it would be. It's um, hard. Everyone's, everyone's got that one, that one, like mine's tequila. I, I can't smell Oh my it. God. Um, oh my God. Yeah. Vodka was the uh, Lindsay's crying in a corner. We need to take her home. <laughs> the other thing you talked about is, is therapy and AA and all those things, because here's, yeah. here's a bigger hurdle that people I talk to um, often have with therapy and with things like that is, is the price. We don't live in a, in a, yeah. in a, in a world or in a country that has set up a lot of great easy access, a- access yeah. to, to mental health, uh, mental yeah. health care. Um, no matter what your seriously. opinions are it's, on healthcare it's not taken in America, seriously as an epidemic. Exactly. Depression, um, anxiety, addiction. So, so what are what are some things? And I know you're you're huge on this, and you share a lot of stuff on on Instagram and in your stories that are that are so helpful for stuff like this. Um, but first of all, uh, AA and all these other things. There's lots of free resources across the country, you don't have to get a, a therapist or whatever. If you have the resources and you feel like that'd be good for you, do it. It, it, it is so, so helpful and helps so many people. But if you're like, like I've been for most of my adult life thinking, man, I wish I could, but that's not what, what that's not covered or whatever. What are some resources that you found helpful that, that you know of um, that are, that are free or cheap or just things to follow or just daily habits that you can start to pick yourself up. Because I read somewhere, one of my favorite quotes, and I don't even remember what I saw it was anything worth doing is worth doing poorly. And if you're in a dark place, either with depression or anxiety or addiction, and it's hard to get out of bed that day, it, 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 if, even if you can't go on a run, go on a walk, even if you can't work out, do do 10 push-ups even if you can't do push-ups get out of bed even if you can't bring yourself to take a shower put deodorant on like it's 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 always anything worth doing is worth doing poorly what is a couple good first steps for people who don't have access who don't have price who are looking to make a change even if they're not at rock bottom even if they're like i can't get out of bed i'm a fully functioning individual i just i feel like i could be better um we, we've talked so much about this and you actually put me onto a few both from just telling me about them and from yeah, following yeah, yeah. Instagram and stuff. What are some of your favorites that people can can start with? Yeah, I I read that book on, I think I gave it, did I give it to you on the ship that was like morning routines? It was like morning routines of successful people. And it was it's like like literally like CEOs of multiple companies, like yada yada people, entrepreneurs, people with their own businesses. And I read through that book and some of it I was like, wow, what is it like to have money? Um, and then two, it was, um, a lot of it was like starting your day off with a perspective shift, um, and 
that is a huge thing in my recovery. That's a huge thing just in my, my quote unquote, my spiritual practice. Um, I, I get up and I try to every single morning, I try to write a gratitude list. And I know that that sounds so basic as hell, but I can't tell you, um, I write, I write a gratitude list and then I try to do three pages of just, just brain dump, basically just like brain drain of this is how I'm feeling. And these were my dreams and I hate my fiance today. And I'm just kidding. I love my fiance today. Or I, if I, if I had a weed whacker, I would cut the avocado tree in the backyard down because it keeps dropping avocados on the ceiling and you like literally anything or, or like, I'm so frustrated with this person or I am devastated by this thing in the news and yada, and I can just get it out because it's feelings. They're not facts. So being able to write all that down and starting in a place of gratitude that's a very privileged thing to say is like, Oh, just start in a place of gratitude, but I will do my best to at least list 10 things. And then I take a picture of those 10 things and I send it to somebody that I trust. I don't know. That's very cool. So even if, even if you're not ready to go to an AA meeting or, or, and and it's not just AA. I have a sponsor that I can send it to or I send all sorts of, yeah, but just somebody that's, that can hold you accountable. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know what? If you don't have somebody, there is there's places to find even those. Um, yes, and I was going to say those those free those free sources. If you, I'm I can only speak to California, and I only know about this because my brother works um, for he's a he's a government worker, and his his um, training in college in psychology and and he was going to be a family therapist and now he's gone into it, 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 I'm not going to totally <laughs> shout him out but like a basically like a child protection service kind of a thing but not quite um because it's a government job um i he he had to um be a, like a free counselor essentially in his training and that is something that is available that students, and maybe that's something that you might not be comfortable with, but there are always people training to be counselors. And if you just need somebody to listen to you, um, that's really, really helpful. And you can, you can find that online if you just search like free counseling Los Angeles and obviously be wary. There's <laughs> the internet is a dark place sometimes, but there is, there yeah, is, a, if, if, if I their counseling in, is out of a, painted brown van with no windows yeah, no no Ooh, maybe. Please. <laughs> that's, not that's the black market about. stay away please counseling does not mean counseling um but it there are there are ways in which to to find the avenues and also i think just creating if you're able to create a a team around you of people that you can trust um look at yeah. your inner circle yeah look at your inner circle look at the people that are supporting you and you, you know, know what? If you feel like, I'm sorry, I'm going to get a little preachy, no. but if you feel like your friends won't understand, if you want to get clean or you want to stop drinking or drink less or, 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 or start a business or whatever your next step is, if you feel like your inner circle, your group of friends is not going to support you, and if you feel like if I stop drinking, they won't be my friends anymore, let me tell you this in the clearest terms, they're not your friends right now. It doesn't matter. If you stop drinking and they're not your friends, then they're not your friends currently because somebody who loves you and supports you is going to try to cheer you on. And if you feel like your inner circle is not doing that, this is the hardest thing to do uh, to tell people to cut friends out or cut family out. It's hard. And you don't have to cut them out necessarily, but find somebody else to be in your circle. Find a new circle. Find a Maybe make them, maybe make your current circle, your current inner circle, your secondary circle and get right. a new inner circle because and that's, that's hard work, like but it's worth it. Absolutely worth it. Um, yeah. I, 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 for a long time was too good at cutting people out and I left myself kind of alone. Yeah. Um, but it allowed yeah. me to start fresh with people that, that cheer me on like yourself and like our yeah. friend Rob and oh, um, Rob. it allowed, I know I talked to him <laughs> yesterday. He's lovely. He's um, the best. But, it's okay to grow and it's yes. okay to change. And, and it's okay to outgrow. Yes. It's okay to out, we outgrow our clothes. We outgrow 
our jobs. Sometimes we outgrow our family, unfortunately. Um, Sometimes fortunately. your family gets so big, you outgrow a home. It's, 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 yeah. it's okay to grow and it's okay we to grow. move on to the next chapter of your life. Mm -hmm. And if the people around you aren't willing to move to that next chapter with you, well, then mm -hmm. some characters don't make it to season two of yeah. the series. They just you don't. Just gotta, you got to write okay. them off. Yeah. yeah. And you know what? Maybe you don't need a season two. Maybe you need a whole spinoff. And I'm yeah. telling you, not everybody from so Cheers true. was on Frasier. Like, it's just so <laughs> make true. your own show. Oh, my um, God. That's it's so a, it's true. It's okay. Uh, speaking of, again, I there's just one more thing I don't think mm -hmm. we can get through this episode without talking about. Speaking okay. of your own show. I know oh. it's not, but it is. Um you left our ship, you went back to LA, you did some very <laughs> cool things there, yeah. and then um, you started vague booking a little bit, like, really excited, and I finally texted you, I was like, what is going on? What? And you were like, what are you doing? And what I love, though, is you were like, what's going on, but you don't have to tell me if you don't want to talk I was like, me. look, look, you obviously <laughs> are not are supposed secrets. to share all of yeah, these yeah, details, yeah. but I need to know something. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. And that turned into, like, like it. it. Yeah. So tell me a little bit about just what that process process was like, um, and and how you got there, and then yes. what it was like to get. I would imagine I don't want to call it your dream job. I, I would assume yeah. one of your dream jobs, and then like a yeah. month and a half later, they're like you need to go home now. Just talk <laughs> a little bit about how yeah. crazy the last nine months of your life. Yeah, was. the my wicked journey started in two thousand and nine. I saw Wicked um, right before my 18th birthday, uh, early April, and it was Teal Wicks and Kendra Kassebaum in San Francisco. They had, obviously, the Wicked Wicked was first Broadway, and then there was a sit-down in Chicago and a sit-down in Los Angeles, Eden Espinosa, you know, the, the, the greats, and then San Francisco. And, um, and I saw it in San Francisco, and Act One ended, and I was weeping like a babe and my mom was with me and she looked to me and she was like you good and um and and I um I went I, and I was not I was not good and she, uh I just never seen anything like it and for those of you who've not seen Wicked I'm not gonna say what happens but act one ends pretty spectacularly and I I was so I felt this mm, this feeling in my in my bones and my chest my ribs and my sternum my, my entire torso was just like a light and I um and I said I'm gonna do that someday and um and I said yeah I'm gonna do that someday yeah I said I'm gonna do that someday and I won't lie to you the things that I had gone through since that moment had kind of pummeled me into an idea that it wasn't gonna happen and so I i I specifically remember a time um, where I think it was like maybe 25 or 26 where I still not had an audition for Broadway. And I was like, wow, I don't think, unless I moved to New York, which was my plan after, after our ship job, um, I was like, I don't think I'm going to have an opportunity to just be in the room, to just like, to just go and be like, I'm an asshole. <laughs> like, pay attention to me. Like I, I, you know, am I, am I, am I right for this? Am I going to be able, you know, like to make a fool out of myself and at least stick my foot in the door. Um, I had just been in Los Angeles and I had done so much theater and I, I had done some television and some film um, with some really incredible people. And I just, through representation and through, I think, what the vision was at the time and where I was, I just wasn't in that room. I, I didn't have an opportunity. And, and then I got home from our ship job. I'd went off and done a million other things that were not in my mind, not leading me to Broadway. Um, and that it wasn't going to happen because if, if I'm reaching a certain age and I haven't won an Oscar or I haven't won a Tony or I haven't done this out or the other, I'm not going to get there. Um, which is a very common thing. Uh, in our industry, uh, to to be like, I'm too old. Meanwhile, you know, Andre De Shields gets his wins. I'm his so first glad song. you said that. But, I was yeah, waiting to like jump to in God, and say that. I also have an Andre De Shields story that I'll tell you, not on this podcast. Um, <laughs> but I, uh, but I, I will. But we're we're not gonna have time. Um, I can't. Okay, focus. Not Andre De Shields. We're focusing on me. Um, I. So I I I came home, and uh, the funny thing was, was on our ship. How many people would come up to me and say, you have to play Alphaba in Wicked? 
how many people would time. say that to me all the time the 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 barricade boys were like you know who you'd be great at you'd be a great alpha these like, she's so she's funny. she's very politely skipping the fact that many of these people would walk right past me in our meeting <laughs> Like, you should be elf and i was like i know and i was like i should, mean that's the but dream. like say hi to me <laughs> and also think about you just just to give you guys a perspective on the the ego battle slash self love um self confidence battle that happens on a on on that happened on this particular job where you have very very well meaning individuals who are slightly older who don't really know anything about the business and they just kind of ask questions willy nilly. They'd be like, why haven't you, why don't you do Broadway? And I'm like, I don't know, man, if it was that, if it was just easy to be like, I think I'll do Broadway. I think I would be on Broadway now. <laughs> and they, and they, you know, or like, you know, you're talented enough. Like, why aren't you doing that? And I'm like, well, cause I'm here doing this. <laughs> first of all, this is a great job. First of all, first of all, I'm in Singapore. I don't want to talk about anything else. <laughs> First of all, I just ate my weight in dumplings. I don't care about anything you have to say. When I say that I miss the food in, in, in South Asia so much, Southeast Asia. Anyway, uh, so, so those, those comments, yeah, the, right. Those comments were always kind of like a, you know, a, something. And, and towards the end of the contract, what I hadn't done. And I was like, why don't we focus on what I have? Cause I've got a resume as long as my entire body. And, um, which is not long. I don't know why I made that comparison. I'm five, three and a half. Um, I, uh, I would towards the end of our contract, I was like, well, I'm going to after this, don't worry. I will. Like I would, I would get a little irritated cause I was like, I fucking had it with these comments. Um, and, and the comments, sometimes they were well-meaning and sometimes they were like belittling specifically belittling and you know, just you know you just kind of get like your hackles up and I'd be like how about you um you're on a cruise why do you care about what I'm doing so I I would kind of have to like take a step back and like breathe it in and be like you you don't have to prove yourself to these people that are never going to see you ever again but at um, the same time you're right it kind of after at the first couple months you're like I was like oh it's okay, fine and then after that. a and while the next couple months you're like people keep six, saying this like, and then the next couple months you're like okay this is irritating and then the next couple months yes. it's like you know what why am I not doing that yeah and but also like repetition repetition yes yeah. and so essentially the the manifestation I hate that word to be completely honest but like speaking things into existence or believing that they can come to you if you are ready for them. Is, if you is, work for If you them. work for them, nothing that has come to me was not earned. And I'm going to say that right now. Nothing that has come my way. I, the journey. And that doesn't hate, mean there weren't the good people journey. to help you along the way. No. Um, it, I'm going to, when I, gonna, when I got the call, we'll wrap this up and we'll, we'll when we'll, I got the I'll call for Wicked, wife, I called I called every single teacher that I've ever had when I got the call for Wicked. I called Stephen. I called my mom. I called my best friend who was a former Alphaba. And I called every single vocal coach, every single professor, every single teacher, and was like, just letting you know this happened. Thank you so much for getting me where I am today. 100%. That's so exactly what I did. Being quote unquote self made doesn't exist. And like, it's okay mm -hmm. to. This is a lot of people's victory. And have yeah. people help you along the way. Um, one of my favorite books that I talk about um, in the first episode of this podcast uh, is, is Outliers, the Stories of Success. And it just, if you haven't read it, pick it up, read it. It will change your worldview so hard because you realize the importance of a good team. You realize the importance of people around you. You realize the importance of not being on a, a schedule and comparing yourself to other people because they had such a different journey than you. It's it's so good and so important. Um, so so tell me a little bit about uh, just what you've been doing since everything closed down. Obviously, like you're still Alphaba, but like also there's no Broadway right now. So uh, what have you been doing? What's that process been like? And we'll we'll. Uh, do this pretty quick and then get to our, our end of show questions and yeah. let people move on with their day. Yeah, I, I'm like thinking, I auditioned in November, got the call in January. By the way, this, that was my first Broadway audition ever. So great way to get my equity card. Fucking crazy. Um, I was like, what's equity? Um, I, I got to New York in January and then rehearsed opened february 25th broadway went dark march 12th and um i've just been teaching it was that soon it was that quick 
Yeah. February 25th was my debut. It was my Broadway debut. Crazy. Crazy. For the record, I, mean, I, I remember I never that believed day. that this would ever have happened. I went into that audition being like, if I, every part is amazing in this show, if I can be tree number two, I will be fucking thrilled. And I honestly was also in a space of like, I just want them to not throw my resume away. <laughs> I just want just them to, I just want them room. to be, whenever, whenever in. they go through uh, LA auditions again and they're like, oh, that, she did a good job. We should, we should think about, maybe think about her for something else. Never, ever, ever. It, I never, ever, ever thought it would be this way. So it was a bit of a whirlwind to move my entire life across the country and, and then move my entire life back across the country <laughs> um and drive through oklahoma where i called you um yeah we and- were she drove through oklahoma <laughs> on her way home and a like the pandemic we facetimed from like 15 minutes away because we couldn't go near each other oh, it was so, so funny. funny and and since then i have been teaching i've been doing master classes which is has been something that i've again perspective I I was like when am I ever I'm gonna have to be like 40 to be able to teach and I'm I teach privately I teach master classes I've been able to teach people alphaba like uh, people that are like I just want to learn how to sing these songs um and I am not the be all end all how to sing these songs I'm still learning how to sing these songs um, I was Although only if you in- haven't seen the video, and I'll, I'll, I might have to just leave a link in the description of all the alphabets. Oh my god, <laughs> bonkers! Oh, it's um, so I, fun I would also like to say how how much of a fan I am of this franchise and like this world and this show that I I had recorded. Shoshana Bean messaged me and was like, "Would you want to be a part of this? We'd love to have the current alphabet part." And I was like, "Hi, yes." Um, and and the video came out, and I was like. I had seen the list and I was like, oh, this is going to be like a cool thing. And then I saw it come out and I was like, oh and it's my everybody. It's so I was like, oh my God. Cool it was crazy. But yeah. Um, so the, it, the parody yeah. of a bearded man in green makeup is also fantastic. Um, so oh good. my God. He's so good. <laughs> so funny. I don't know if you've but, seen um, any more of, of his videos, but they're fabulous. Link yeah. that below as well. Oh, they're so Guys, good. if you're listening, I, I, uh, I don't think we're even going to edit this down. I feel you like got, gonna, you got two kids with so ADD just chatting but, away. Yeah, so this was, this was a longer episode than I thought it was going to be, but we're going to, Oh my God. Um, if you, if you enjoyed this, let us know. And we'll just have to have Lindsay back on. Cause uh, again, I've had eight months of stories with Lindsay and I know she's got yeah. way more than an hour and 15 minutes or whatever to share. <laughs> uh, so if you enjoyed this, ask questions and, and we'll make sure that, um, that, she sees those and can answer them and maybe we'll do this again soon. Uh, but, uh, I always, uh, I always wanted to interview people, uh, from, from growing up with Leno and old episodes of Carson that my grandfather had recorded on VHS, um, and all those things, but I really got into it with James Lipton. And, uh, so I've created my own end of show, uh, questions. So we're just going to get these, these going and then we'll, we'll get on our way. But question one, if you had a time machine and could go back and witness one event from history without changing anything, you just get to mm-hmm. be there, see it, be in the moment. Where mm-hmm. would you go? When would you go? And why? Um, I have uh, morbidly. I I really m- well. I would really obviously Shakespeare. I would really love to see. Um, sh- Shakespeare actively playing in his own shows because he was a player as well. I would yeah. love to see um, Hamlet the way the way that it was with those accents, with the way that the rhyming and the iambic pentameter. I would really love to see that. Um, I would also love to have seen what our country looked like before anybody else got here. I would just love to have seen before any trees got America cut down. untouched yeah. America untouched well, not before, untouched before, but touched by the people who were touched by the people here. who were here yeah. first before it was known as America I would just love to see cuz this this country is so big and the 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 climates are so vast and I would just love to see how quiet it was um because we Can live you imagine now, sitting in the stillness of like Yosemite before they were park with rangers. no cabins yeah with uh, yeah. before trails um i just want to see like what the highways looked like before there were highways 
You know what I mean? Like I want to, I want to see before, before that's called, roads that's had called, to be paved. That's called uh, Kansas. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, oh that's my called, God. Yeah. That's called New Mexico. Um, I, but yeah, I just, I just kind of want to see, and I, and I think I would love to see any of the world before in, in incredible civilization was, was put in. And I'm not saying that the colonization of America is incredible, but I would love to, I would just love to see this land as it was before Mm -hmm. massive tree cutting and, you know, and and just the industrialization and, and all of that. I just think there would be something I love. I love land and I love nature and I'm very, a very outdoorsy young lady. Yes. Um, That's lovely. So (laughs) uh, question number two, what is one thing you wish had never been invented? Um, the calories on menus. You want to eat in peace, like you're, um, you're I just really aggressively with the we calories. again, again, maybe, maybe have me on again, but I just think I just think that the obsession with um what foods are right, what foods are wrong, um food war and and all of that. And what do calories even mean? What do calories things, even mean because some like fats are good and all those basal things. metabolic yes. rates are different forever. It's just I think that such an oversimplification of one number of what's going into your body. Uh, yeah, yeah yeah and i just i think that it adds adds stress to what should be no no i'm not saying like i mean listen live your life but like a triple decker burger with onion rings i would like to know <laughs> a little bit i'd just like to be like if i eat this whole thing am i gonna die <laughs> but yeah, um i want like, access to those numbers but maybe but don't like but but don't ruin my day <laughs> um and it's not and that's just not that's not just like a me as like an actor trying to watch no it's just i think that there's there's been so much put pressure put on the world of food that it it now has done the adverse effect of like obsession with it, and I I just and I, I love where that, where health is going and the people yeah I love the people just are, eat. are interested eat. in their health I just yeah. signed up for um you know a, a new health program yesterday yeah. you know what I mean health is important yeah. but be, obsessing over it leads to such issues especially in our industry how many people do we know yeah. with severe body dysmorphia and you're like you're beautiful like yeah. are these dudes who have like I eight packs it. and, 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 and yeah. it's 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 not just women i know guys who it's, are mm-hmm. hate their bodies look a billion times better than me and yeah, yeah so it's, it, just being careful about how we present that information and, and just yeah. if someone wants to go out to a nice restaurant and have a steak and get the fries instead of the salad let them yeah. love it love it love it question yeah. number three what is one book that's had an impact on your life that you want to encourage people to read? um codependent no more uh i'm a codependent person which is what we call outside issues in my recovery program um and i I am someone who, um, if you're happy, I'm happy and uh, people pleasing and which, which is just something that happens a lot in recovery, um, or people who have been through recovery. Um, the, I'm going to say, oh my God, I love this book and I can't remember. Melody Beattie by Melody Beattie. Um, it's called codependent no more how to stop controlling others and start caring for yourself because at the end of the day when you're trying to make sure that somebody else is okay you're not you're trying to control a situation and um and i would love to not try to control any situations because i'm so fucking tired all the time <laughs> i would just love to be to have my own space to be my own human being um and and it serves it serves no one to be able to be like, no, 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 let me like take care of every, do you know how exhausting it is to be so fully taken care of? And that doesn't mean you shouldn't be caring or care for other people and stuff, but it should. Yes. Yeah. But when you you are so obsessed with making sure that everybody likes you, oh my God, aren't you tired? And I, and I do that. I do that a lot where I'm like, oh my God, that person. And you know what? A lot of people do. And and yeah. Again, I don't want all of these episodes just to be for entertainers, but having an entertainer yeah. on, we'll, we'll talk a little more about it. But that's very, very common in our industry. Of, and if, of, I just want people to like me. I just want people to like me, and I don't, yeah. and I don't want to be perceived in a bad way. So I'm just going to be helpful. And then a, a, and I'm going to put a second part to this book, um, "The Starless Sea" by, by "The Starless Sea" by Aaron Morgenstern 
It's fiction. It's fantastic. If you love the never ending story in any way, you will love this book. That's all. Oh, say that, say that again. The Starless Sea. The Starless Sea by Erin Morgenstern. She also wrote a book called The Night Circus. I have never read anything so within and without and meta, like basically reading a book. A person will read a book and say, wow, I love this book within the story. And then in the next chapter, or a person will walk, he, a character walks down an alleyway and goes, there's a door painted here. I wonder if I can open it. I'm not going to open it. I'm, I'm too scared. And then the next day walks past and the door has been painted over and he's like, wow, I missed that opportunity. And then in the next chapter, somebody is reading a book with the first chapter being about a boy going down an alley. It's literally like never ending story where it's just everybody. Very cool. We are with these characters reading, reading their stories through in and throughout. And it's fat. I've, I've needed. That I've sounds needed like one to really get lost of, in. I've needed yeah. something to be uh, to escape within, and I've I've not been reading a lot of fiction lately, and I'm so grateful that I got into this book. It's fabulous. You know what? That's that's crazy. Really I um. Hard. Oh, there's yeah, the train. When, when Hello. Get so, <laughs> yep. Can you hear the, so the train? Focused. Actually, no. I've got I've got a plug in that takes all the. Oh, amazing! Yeah. Uh, yep. Um, very very easy for my podcast editor. Yeah. Uh, so he just has to worry about all the dumb stuff that I say instead of. <laughs> the stuff going on in the yeah. Um, but. Yeah, no, that sounds great. When you get so focused, and I've done this myself, you, you especially and, recently, mm -hmm. about self-help and business, and I've been so attuned to marketing and growing and and, yeah. um, and consumer behavior and those things that sure. I was talking to uh, Rob just the other day, like, I don't know the last time I just sat down and watched a movie. Read a book for and that's pleasure. my favorite yeah, thing to do movies. is watch a movie or read yeah. a book that that's fiction and stuff. So, um, yeah, that's a good reminder for people to improve yourself, get better, but take some time to just enjoy this life that we're living and get lost yeah. in, in art and in literature. My, ima and my in imagination cinema. was dwindling yeah. and I feel, I feel like having read through this, I feel the same way I, I felt when I was reading Narnia or when I was reading The Hobbit and I, and every, and every turn I, I was like, Ooh, that tree could be something or Ooh, Ooh, if I go down that way, the way that the sunlight's hitting that, what if oh, I, I what if I turn around and there's something special behind the book? And that's, that's something that Again, just just feeding that inner child and 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 respecting and letting that that inner small person, that small like young young being within you that may or may not have been <sighs> getting everything that they needed, let them out and let them explore. Because that sounds like a blast. It's hard not to. Uh, yeah, I'm absolutely. That's a, you've made the sale. I can't wait. Uh, so, <laughs> no, Codependent No so More good. by Melody Beattie no and The Starless Sea by Erin Morgenstern. By Aaron it's available um, on Audible. It's very good. Very good. It's very um, good. And this is this is a question that again I hope I can retire soon, but I'm going to ask it until I don't have to anymore. Yes. Um, what is something that you've learned in the craziness of, of 2020 that you want to remember to take with you as we're through all this and life starts to look a little more air quote normal? Yeah. Um, that we at least myself, who I am, the way that I look, who I am in this world, what I was born into in this world, I'm very lucky. And to remember that the word normal is going to mean something different now. And that normal may not have always been the best option to begin with. That normal, what we thought is normal, m may not behoove us. Um, so that's that's something moving forward. Just my curiosity, my questioning, my empathy. Um, should this be this way, or is it only this way? Because it's always been this way. Can we improve? If we, improve? if we had to pause for four to six months, yeah, would I still do this this way? Yeah. And the answer for me is no. Yeah. The answer for me is no, which is kind of. Uh, maybe it's a privilege to say exciting, but like in it, cause it isn't, um, but there's in, in internally, there's something about me going like, Oh, this is the growth. Oh, this is where we begin to unlock. And this is where we begin to ascend to a different state of understanding of like, yeah, no, that doesn't work for me. And I don't think that works for a lot of people. And how do I, how do I through, through my abilities, through my compassion, through my, my, um, ability to feel empathy how can i help or get out of the fucking way or aid um in the change so 
Oh, uh, so good. Um, you know what? I, I've not done this on an episode yet, but there is so oh, no. much good meat in here that I'm going to do a little recap. I'm going to try. Okay. Um, and people are probably like, just end the episode, man. But, uh, <laughs> That's how most people feel when they talk the, to me. Oh my God, please just shut said, up. One of the first things that you said that, that I loved was start your day with gratitude and just get your yeah. thoughts out there and just be still with yourself and, and try mm-hmm. to understand what you're thinking um, mm-hmm. because that's the way to grow and, and, and address your problems, address what's frustrating you, address mm-hmm. what's making you happy and do more of that. And Feelings again, just facts. start your day with, with gratitude. Um, another thing that, that we didn't pause and talk about, but that I thought was really important was something I'm bad at is reaching out to the right people, even if I do have a relationship with them. Do you know how long it took me to get the courage to ask you to come on this podcast? And you're one of like my favorite people. Um, oh my God. I get it, when you talked about um, Robert Ulrich or whatever, and your mom said, just reach out. And it doesn't matter if you don't Terrifying. feel like you have the, the, the relationship necessary or whatever. If there's someone who can help you along the way in this world of Instagram messages and emails that are on everyone's out. website, just reach out, just reach out. And that goes not just for business and, and uh, things like that, but personal growth. And that can be therapy. That can be a meeting that can just be an accountability partner that's saying, Hey, I know, I know that when we hang out, I look happy. I'm having a tough time. Can we, can can I just, can I just text you in the mornings and just tell you a couple of things that make me Mm -hmm. happy? I know it sounds great or crazy, but it would help me, whatever, reach out and ask for the things you need. And you know what, if they say no, they say no. And especially in business, there's nothing to lose. lose. Um, Especially if you're in search of personal growth, in business or in life or in partnership or in companionship or in just yeah. happiness. If that's what you're in search of, people, the, the right people will, will kind of make themselves known, especially if you reach out. So um, and that just goes along with, there's no such thing as being self-made. There's no such thing. No one has gotten to where they are successfully without amazing people along the way or terrible people along the way that mm-hmm. they learned from. Holding um, lanterns. Exactly. So just just get where you need to be, and uh, and roll with the punches. Because sometimes you work and work and work for years, and you see very few results. And then out of nowhere, you get your first Broadway audition, and then you're like, well, on Broadway. And then two and a half weeks later, you're no longer on Broadway, and you yeah, still oh, well. gotta. There's no such thing as job security. That's yeah. One thing we've learned, yeah. not just in our business. We talk about it in our business all the time, mm-hmm. but. In any business, there's no such thing as job security. So find yeah. something that makes you happy and, and that yeah. you like doing and always be ready to roll. And that's something I'm not yeah. good at either. That's not advice I'm giving. That advice I'm taking. From taking. This. Just be oh, ready yeah. to, to go with, with what's next. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's actually, like I said um, a few times, that's kind of become my motto is what's next. Not just to always be looking towards the future, but I get so ethereal on all the things I want to do and accomplish that. I need to distill it down to what is next, what needs to happen right now. In fact, yeah. we're going to end it with this idea. Um, we were in Alaska. We were on a bus going to see Rocket Man in <gasps> Juno. That was one of the most incredible days. It that was. It was a great day. We were in Juno, Alaska. So and we had to get a city bus. We weren't positive we were going the right direction for yeah. a while. And but the bus stop was in the middle was, of the road, in the middle of a forest. Yeah, it was uh, next to these spruce trees. Anyway, it was a great day. But while we're on the bus, we look up, and and I saw it, and and it was a poem from a local poet. This bus had some like art from local artists and poem, uh, mm-hmm. and it was very cool. And one of them was a poem about a, a guy who mm-hmm. was Waking having up. to put his dog down. And no, it, no, no, no. This was it. Was it the? Poems? Was it the the man who woke up and was like looking at the sunrise, having to go walk his dog? Was it yes. that one? Yes. He's, yes. His dog is in it. His dog is an important. Yes. Part, but it was just about the beauty of a moment, and you don't want to miss it because you don't know if something and he, good he is going to happen next yeah. or something bad is going to happen next. It doesn't matter because right now yeah. is important. And there was a phrase in there that, mm-hmm. that I loved and I, I kind of nudged you and 
pointed at it and and yep. we both just kind and of it's now it tattooed on my stomach <laughs> uh-huh. the, the, the the poem was, was about this man waking up and he was so tired and like going about we all do this we wake up we get tired we make our coffee we go through our day he had to walk his dog in the early morning before he had to go to his job and do the blah 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 and thinking about his lists and he looked down at his dog and his dog was taking in the world as it was coming and breathing in the world and sniffing and excited and wagging her tail. And he said that he looked at his dog and he looked up and he said, and there I stood alive here in the holy now. And I was like, well, there it is. (laughs) And the holy now is now tattooed on my, my, uh, the energy node in my tummy. (laughs) <laughs> and it's uh, it's beautiful. Well, I'm glad I'm and glad I, got that I asked tattoo you about in the poem because I yeah. couldn't I couldn't remember what it was, and I, I thought you a picture, the dog I died. So <laughs> it's very good to know that 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 poem had a much happier yes. ending than I thought it did. Yes, it um, did. So that's great. I'm glad we talked about it. But just remember, yeah. folks, you watched me get that live tattoo. In the now. <laughs> I did. Yeah, it was great. Uh, in Juno at a, a very cool tattoo shop. Yeah. Um, Anyway, gosh, this has been so much fun. Uh, we are way over time. I'm so gotta sorry. Go teach. No, it's great. <laughs> I say over time, like we've got to fit into an hour long right. slot for a, a network television show. But um, to the listeners, I hope you've had a good time. I hope you've gotten something out of this. Um, like I said, Lindsay and I are very close. Where can they find you, by the way? Instagram at? Um, I'm on Instagram at Lindsay Heather Pierce. Lindsay is spelled with an A Y and Pierce is spelled with a P E A. And then I'm not really on Twitter, but you can find me there at Ms. Lindsay, Lindsay Pierce. And I think that's it. I'm on YouTube as Lindsay Heather Pierce. So yeah, Instagram definitely is a very great place to connect with her. Um, also here, uh, in the, podcast on the youtube page comment there uh yeah. join the right brain realism facebook group uh we'll start a discussion there and uh if you have questions i'll make sure that she gets them or if we've got enough we'll just have to do this again um because believe it or not there's more that we could talk about oh my um, god uh, so, yeah so it, if you could if you couldn't believe that yeah believe that we have we have yeah. hours there's upon more. hours upon hours Oh, well, Lindsay, it was fantastic to catch, to catch up. Thank you for taking time out of your day um, for this. I, I, I've i learned a lot on just always talking to you about about just the growth that you've had and, and um, the decisions Likewise. you've made to, to better yourself in, in kind of drastic ways and, uh, and, and not letting it be a drastic change in your life. And that's um, in who you are, how you treat people. And it's just... I learned a lot from you in our time together and I've learned a lot from you today and uh, you're just a fantastic person to be around and learn from. So thank you so much. We'll see you next time here on Right Brain Realism.